Okay, hi everybody, 12 with two, let's kick it off. So uh, welcome, uh, if you are here for the event, Telehealth and HIV Prevention and Care Emerging Approaches, you're in the right place. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Daniel Davidson. I'm Assistant Director of Sierra's Community Research and Implementation Corps and um, the organizer for our New England HIV Implementation Science events. So if it's your first time joining us for a network event, and it may be uh, because it's been quite a little bit, um, we're an initiative of the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on AIDS at Yale, or CIRA, um, part of the Yale School of Public Health. Um, we uh, are New England's only National Institute of Mental Health funded AIDS Research Center, and we support innovative interdisciplinary research that focuses on the implementation of HIV prevention and treatment and the elimination of HIV disparities. Um, our partner in the network is the Providence Boston Center for AIDS Research, and they join us in co-sponsoring today's event, uh, along with Yale's READY Consultation Hub, and that stands for Rigorous, Rapid, and Relevant Evidence Adaptation and Implementation to End the HIV Epidemic. Um, and that's part uh, of CIRA and the School of Public Health and um, CMEPS. So the network, um, the network started in 2014 with an inaugural symposium and it was created to stimulate and support research and evaluation collaborations across New England to foster partnerships among agencies, stakeholders and researchers and to focus on implementation science in small urban areas with a high prevalence of HIV. It's been, it's been some time since we have met in person at those symposia. So um, we're gonna try to meet some of these same goals in a short amount of time virtually today. Um, I am going to turn it over to the directors of CIRA and uh, the CIFAR. So why don't we start with Trace? Hi, thank you, Daniel. Welcome everyone. This has been, um, we are excited to kind of bring us back together. It's been quite some time and I think uh, relevant given uh, the effects of COVID and how we all kind of had to vert turn to virtual approaches to prevention and care that we will focus today on the effects of telehealth, a really important uh, topic both in, in research and practice. So thank you and welcome and uh, thank you all for coming and thanks to our great speakers. Susan? Hi, I'm Susan Kuyuvin. I'm the director of the Providence Boston Center for AIDS Research, which is a collaboration between Lifespan Brown University Boston University and Boston Medical Center. And we feel very privileged to have been co-sponsoring a series of these uh, symposiums. Unfortunately, it can't be in person this year. And, but we share the vision of the CIRA. We're extremely supportive. And I think we really need this because we are a conglomeration of small states in New England and I think being together is making us better uh, instead of just small patches, as you know, Rhode Island is the smallest state. <laughs> and, and we feel that by being part of the CIRA, the consortium, that we have a, more of a voice and more of a visibility and our CIFAR is extremely supportive of this. So hopefully, next year we are able to see each other in person and have those wonderful lunches and venues instead of Zoom all the time. So thank you. Thanks, Susan. Um, so just to tell you real quick what we have in store today. So we're gonna hear um, uh, uh, an overview, um, giving us a little bit of background on telehealth uh, and HIV. Um, prevention and care with kind of a focus on, on what uh, has transpired over during the pandemic. Um, so I'll introduce Roman in a moment to do that. Um, we'll hear some examples of telehealth in practice as well as from a research perspective. And um, then uh, a little more than halfway through the event, we will break out into small groups. You do not have to stay for that. You did indicate ahead of time whether you intended to stay. And so we built um, some breakout rooms based on, on your interests, um, but feel free to chat um, myself or Pete um, 
and let us know if you think you want to change that or if you if you know you're going to leave. Um, so that'll be happening probably around 1.15. Um, the purpose, we'll revisit kind of the purpose of those, those groups as we get there, but just in case you're deciding whether to stay, um, they'll be focused around particular funding opportunities and it's a chance um, to get to, to get uh, in, input from your colleagues and potentially make some new connections um, to collaboratively approach uh, um, HIV prevention and care through um, these particular funding announcements. So um, I will, uh, Roman, if you want to start getting your slides up and I will uh, give you a little introduction. I've tried to keep these bios brief. As you, as you well know, people have a lot of credentials and um, you're welcome to Google anyone who you'd like to know more about. But Roman is, uh, Roman Shrestha is an assistant professor in the Department of Allied Health Sciences and a principal investigator at the Institute for Collaboration on Health Intervention and Policy or INCHIP at UConn. His research has primarily centered on interventions and implementation science at the interface of HIV and substance use. He works domestically and internationally, and he is particularly focused on M Health. So I will turn it over to you, Roman. Thanks so much. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, are you able to see my screen? PowerPoint. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel, and thanks everyone for joining uh, today's session. I feel really uh, privileged to be talking about the telehealth and the current state of telehealth, you know, more so in the HIV prevention and um, research uh, landscape. Um, so uh, just a quick, uh, just a quick background before I move on to, you know, uh, the presentation, uh, just to make sure that we are using the same definition throughout the course of this presentation. So telehealth, you know, it's defined as the delivery and facilitation of, you know, health or different health related services, uh, whether it's, you know, medical care or provider and patient interaction, education, health information sharing, and also there's a self care involved in that uh, using various platforms of telecommunication technologies. Um, it's a tool that you know that we use in the medicine or public health field, but it's not a separate, uh, you know, separate form of medicine. And um, as you can see here, uh, you know, there are different ways of, you know, or different modalities of telehealth, um, you know, starting from the live video conferencing, which, you know, it uses the real time two way interaction between the providers and also the patient or their caregivers or, or you know, uh, other, mem other members of the key stakeholders, you know, involved in that uh, treatment process. The other one is the store and forward, which is more of a, a synchronous transfer of uh, data from um, you know, uh, the patient to the healthcare provider so that they can be involved in that um, healthcare decision-making process. The other one is the remote patient monitoring, uh, which is uh, when the health history from a patient at, you know, located at one location is transferred to the provider at a different location uh, in terms of you know, involving in patient's care. Um, and the last one is the mobile health, uh, which is also known as M Health. Um, basically, the use of different technologies, uh, you know, whether it's tablets or mobile phones, uh, to support public health education practice and cl uh, clinical care. Uh, when you look at the utilization of telehealth, uh, you know, it's been growing even before the pandemic came in. Um, you know, more recently, due to the COVID nineteen pandemic. The adoption of telehealth, you know, kind of skyrocketed, um, you know, across you know the different areas of healthcare system within the United States and also globally. And uh, if you look at the you know the graph in the screen there, in April of 2020, uh, you know, overall health telehealth utilization, um, whether it's for office visits or outpatient care, uh, was about 78 times higher. Uh, then that was in February of the same year. So, you know, just within that really short time frame, you know, that really uh, um, skyrocketed. And as you all can predict that, you know, there are different, you know, things that went to it, um, whether it's the increased consumer or, you know, a provider willingness to use telehealth services for various reasons, uh, you know, to look, you know, take care of various uh, health healthcare needs, um, or whether it's the, the change in regulation uh, which enabled you know greater access um, and also reimbursement, you know, that went to using telehealth services. You know, after that initial peak, um, you know, there was a, uh, you know, the utilization of telehealth kind of stabilized at around you know 38 times higher, still you know higher than that of uh, uh, you know before the pandemic. Um, 
So regardless of where things are, it's still high. And, you know, uh, and the, the, the good news is that there's a significant in investment um, in the virtual care or digital health, uh, which is really fueling innovation, uh, you know, in terms of using the, these different uh, technologies for uh, healthcare service delivery. And, um, and also with the virtual healthcare delivery models and, and, and different business models that has gone into this telehealth uh, uh, in a world, uh, you know, moving purely from, you know, the virtual urgent care to also, you know, looking at the longitudinal virtual care or providing our integration of different healthcare services and also more so in the hybrid or, you know, in-person model where there's a combination of both a hybrid and the, um, uh, you know, combination of both in-person and telehealth services that goes into uh, into this uh, delivery process. So, uh, as the providers and consumers have continues to uh, use telehealth over many you know many months, more so you know looking into the COVID nineteen pan uh, you know context of you know the perceived acceptability of telehealth has also kind of increased uh, over the months. Um, and among physicians, uh, we've seen that 64% of the, you know, the, uh, the, the physicians were um, surveyed, reported greater comfort uh, in terms of using telehealth uh, for different services, you know, than, you know, that it was before COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and 74% reported that, you know, uh, there was a huge, you know, they're satisfied in terms of using telehealth. Um, and customers or consumers or users has also kind of, you know, um, reported similar acceptance levels of acceptance. Um, for example, over three-fourths uh, reported high levels of um, you know, uh, satisfaction uh, in terms of you know, using telehealth services. Um, and 76% reported that they were likely to use telehealth services um, even in the future, uh, even if to, you know, even after the COVID pandemic kind of you know, goes to the new norm or uh, you know, slows down. Um, and all of these, you know, data really aligns with the report that, you know, the volume of internet searches where, you know, in terms of looking at different health related, uh, telehealth related topics has grown significantly uh, since March of last year. Um, and our search terms like telehealth doctor has increased by over 900%. And uh, telehealth and telemedicine near me that the, you know, the search term that particular one has increased more than 3,500% uh, um, um, just within this past few months. So as with many, many conditions are, are with different, you know, specialties, um, telehealth also represents this really innovative approach to, uh, to address different health, uh, you know, HIV related, you know, prevention uh, services are also care or treatment services. Um, and it can be used to, you know, like, to you know to look at or to address different gaps uh, within the uh, the continuum of care both for prevention and uh, treatment services um, whether it's you know looking at um, you know how low the the you know the, the the prescription of prep has been even though you know there's a significant number of people who may be indicated for prep or whether it's you know looking at um, you know how many are diagnosed with HIV or who are able to you know have achieved viral suppression within different you know, stages of this uh, HIV prevention and care continuums, telehealth could be implemented uh, you know, more so as an alternative option um, to connect to these people who may be at risk for HIV or also you know, uh, who are already HIV positive and want to continue through that uh, care and treatment process. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, even before the uh, you know COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, telehealth was already part of the solution for uh, within this EHE ending the HIV epidemic plan for America, looking at a solution to achieve at least ninety percent a reduction in, in new infections by um, twenty thirty, and it can be leveraged in many ways. You know, as you can see in the slide up here, uh, you know there are the four pillars for uh, EHE plans, and each. At, in, at its uh, pillar of this plan, you know, you can, uh, or, you know, the provider or even research, uh, researchers can use uh, different uh, modalities of telehealth um, to address, uh, address the needs for uh, both the providers and also the consumers um, in terms of addressing, uh, you know, barriers to testing or linking someone to prep or um, uh, care services 
uh, case management, medical case management, a virtual um, uh, you know, appointment with, um, with provider, prep providers or HIV specialists, and many other ways of public health services that goes within the HIV uh, prevention and service arena. So uh, in terms of the current state of telehealth and HIV, uh, there was a survey conducted last year, uh, July of 2020, um, which looked at uh, you know, the, the state of telehealth and HIV prevention, care and treatment among uh, different aid services organizations, community health organizations, and also healthcare providers around the United States. Uh, so that survey found that just a uh, little over half of the uh, little, you know, under the half, uh, which is about 40, 48 percent uh, had started providing telehealth services primarily due to you know COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, that's when different clinical services, uh, you know, started um, closing their um, you know, services because of the uh, COVID-19 and they moved into telehealth uh, services. And 81% reported that they're providing HIV uh, services uh, using telehealth. Um, and 71% reported that they're likely to continue using, um, offering you know, telehealth services even after the pandemic was over or under control. So uh, moving on in terms of different you know, services within HIV uh, and how these providers were using uh, telehealth, um, more than 60% reported that they were using uh, you know, some form of telehealth services uh, for HIV clinical care, medical case management, uh, case management, or even offering different mental health services. Um, so 46% uh, you know, were off, uh, offering uh, PrEP uh, using telehealth. Um, however, if you look at the other you know, areas which are related to HIV uh, prevention and treatment, that hasn't you know, quite uh, you know, uh, you know, translated too well into the services. Uh, for example, in terms of HIV testing, it was only about 27% of this provider. Uh, and it was, uh, so STI testing was about 27% uh, and uh, HIV testing was about 22% um, of them provided uh, through telehealth services. Um, and you know, when we look at the you know, uh, telehealth uh, in terms of providing uh, you know, medicated, uh, medicated assisted treatment, it was only about 19% uh, who reported using telehealth services. So uh, the survey also into, you know, looked at different barriers to using telehealth uh, services. You know, as, um, as we can you know, guess, patient inexperience in, uh, you know, using these technologies was one of the you know, most common barriers. There are other you know, daunting experience that patient may have as they're using this technology, uh, distrust of technology, especially for you know, use uh, uh, to address different health services, um, privacy concerns, a lack of resources to purchase a new, uh, you know, whether it's smartphone, tablets um, to use for uh, you know, health services, and even access to you know, a technology wireless, con or wireless connection. You know, these are some of the key barriers. Um, uh, and looked into in the you know the large digital divide that we've you know we've been seeing in the news, um, which were you know listed as one of the you know a few of the common barriers for telehealth utilization. Um, so um, you know as we see you know telehealth appears to uh, stay a robust you know option in terms of providing cares. Uh, you know, and I think it doesn't, you know, you know, it doesn't seem wrong if we say that, you know, telehealth is here to stay. Um, and there hasn't been significant efforts made, uh, you know, at different levels, whether it's local level, state level or federal level uh, to ensure that, you know, telehealth services you know, that has gained such a momentum during the COVID-19 pandemic remains part of the, you know, the permanent um, part of the American healthcare system. So now moving into, you know, some of the key innovation, um, in terms of you know services and resources in the context of HIV, uh, you know there are different you know models of uh, you know telehealth you know being used uh, in terms of HIV prevention and treatment. Um, looking you know at the HIV self testing, um, different you know uh, researcher you know many researchers even uh, healthcare services are using uh, HIV self testing initiatives using telehealth. Um, you know, it kind of offers that uh, platform to do the testing at home, especially for those who do not have access to, you know, healthcare services close by. 
uh, who doesn't feel like they want to go to the you know the clinic to you know get tested um, it offers that opportunity and not only that it also offers the opportunity to get connected or linked to different uh, you know prevention or treatment services so this online to offline model of you know using telehealth uh, for HIV testing has been you know uh, has been growing more so in the recent years um, and there are a few examples healthminder it's an app based intervention uh, you know big developed by Patrick Sullivan from Emory, uh, you know, in terms of improving uh, access to HIV testing, um, you know, patients are able, or users are able to auto self-testing kits from home. And also they're able to do e-consultations um, uh, using the app. And there are many other apps, uh, you know, that are in the process of being developed or implemented uh, at the moment. There's this e-test, uh, you know, system that was developed by researchers out of Brown University. Uh, so what it really does is whenever uh, the user opens the uh, self-testing kit, it sends a signal to the HIV testing counselor so that when the counselor gets that notification, they call the test, uh, you know, the, the user so that there's an appropriate linkage in, um, in, 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 in linkage after the HIV testing. Uh, similarly, you know, the use of virtual uh, platform for uh, PrEP delivery has been, you know, gaining a lot of momentum recently, um, which is also known as teleprep in many contexts. Um, and in many of the settings, you know, uh, we, you know, people are using either websites or, or, or even mobile application, even text messaging uh, services uh, for uh, delivery of PrEP, uh, uh, PrEP related cares. Um, and there's the additional follow-up or appointment and also counseling that's still happening in the same platform. So five of the key components, uh, and they do not go in any particular order, uh, but I mostly follow that you know, pattern um, are, there's a screening process for you know, screening for uh, PrEP. There's a e -con uh, consultations happening either you know, via the smartphone, a Zoom, uh, even um, using uh, text messaging services. Uh, there's you know, lab order. Uh, depending upon different research contexts or services contact, they're, they're happening either in person or using self-test uh, prescription and delivery of PrEP medication um, after that. So some of the you know, key, you know, some of the really important um, or key innovation in terms of uh, PrEP delivery using telehealth uh, has been, uh, you know, Iowa teleprep program that launched back in 2017. Uh, there's also UCLA-led prep tech um, web-based and also a smartphone app-based uh, intervention going on, and also looking from the you know um, from the pro you know for-profit organization, there are PlusCare, Nergs, uh, Mister, and Sister. Those are you know some of the apps or web-based platform. You know those are in place at the moment in terms of you know uh, improving access to uh, prep. Uh, so those are more from the provider to patient, uh, provider to patient interaction modality. Um, there's also provider to provider uh, and also store and uh, forward consult, more so in the e-consult system. Uh, I'm just going to quickly touch up on the, uh, the, you know, some of the key examples. Uh, so Iowa Teleprep, I think it's a really unique uh, collaboration between the, uh, you know, the, you know, the pharmacist, uh, and the ID physicians at the University of Iowa and in partnership with uh, the Iowa Department of Public Health. Um, um, so basically, you know, in, instead of the clinician, it's the pharmacist who are leading, you know, leading this whole consultation, making sure that the labs are ordered and reviewed and, and the medication are delivered as, as, as ordered. Uh, so, you know, there's a collaborative, um, there's a, the agreement in place between the pharmacist and the uh, clinicians so that they are able to you know, provide that care. And research has shown that you know, this is really feasible to uh, provide uh, PrEP, um, especially in the rural settings. Um, and same with the provider to provider, uh, you know, this is where you know, we use technology to create communities of uh, you know, practice and deliver clinical mentorship, uh, uh, especially where in the rural settings that, you know, um, and there isn't, you know, uh, the, the specialists aren't quite accessible. Um, so it was launched to basically educate and support community of prep providers in, you know, in, a, in various reasons. And one of the examples, really, you know, a you know, good example is happening you know, out of University of Washington in Seattle, um, also known as Tele Eco Clinic. Um, so out of, you know, they've been doing 
this for a while. Um, and they basically incorporate quarterly prep didactics and monthly prep, uh, you know, case discussion, look at different, uh, you know, different uh, topics related to PrEP, uh, whether it's, you know, clinical indications for PrEP, use of PrEP for conception by, you know, serodiscordant couples, looking at different financial barriers that goes into PrEP, uh, and also, you know, different uh, clinical case uh, uh, best practices within PrEP. So those are a few things that are discussed within that. Um, and because of how successful this, um, pro you know, this, um, Clinic has been, it's been now spreading internationally in, in, different, uh, in different settings as well. So there's a, the store and forward consult, uh, the, the really nice example is VA's e-consult system where you know, the, the PCP is making requests to remote specialist uh, and the specialist reviews the request and make uh, you know, uh, recommendation without having to see, without having to have a face-to-face -face visit between the, the patient and the specialist. Uh, again, you know, this, this approach has been found to be really, uh, you know, uh, successful in terms of, um, you know, improving the timeliness of providing PrEP um, and minimizing the travel time uh, for folks who are in a really, you know, rural settings and do not have access to um, HIV uh, care specialists. So lastly, moving on to the HIV care and treatment, again, there has been a lot of research uh, and I'm just able to cover really few examples. Uh, um, you know, most of them have looked, you know, into how this approach can be, you know, um, used to move uh, people living with HIV from, you know, um, from different stages of um, HIV care continuum to ultimately achieve viral suppression. Um, and it has been used in different settings um, as well. So one of the examples is the Alabama eHealth, uh, uh, e which was uh, launched back in 2011. Um, so basically it offers um, a very cost-effective way to connect people who are living with HIV to uh, different medical care, uh, medical care in the rural settings. Um, so uh, some of the key takeaways is that, uh, you know, the evolution of uh, this telehealth has been directly correlated with, you know, different advancement in, in, in the technology or in also in the, you know, uh, the connectivity uh, of, uh, of uh, different platforms and um, introducing, you know, telehealth, especially in the HIV prevention and care is really important, uh, you know, given the fact that, you know, all this research so that it's been really, it's really feasible and also, uh, you know, uh, considered to be more convenient and comfortable to, you know, patient population. And it, at the same time, it also improves outcomes and uh, increased client and provider satisfaction. So as we start to think about, you know, developing and implementing this platform, I think it's really important that we also pay attention to, you know, different barriers uh, uh, and also different things that we need to look out, whether it's, you know, integrating uh, data in a better way, whether it's, you know, uh, having all the key stakeholders in the in the same ecosystem whether it's about uh, you know alignment of incentives um, not sure how that's going to turn around after the public health emergency is over and also you know bridging the digital gap uh, which is really you know important um, so that we don't really avoid leaving the you know the, the most vulnerable people out of this uh, telehealth uh, services so uh, with that my um, I'm happy to take any any questions. Great, thanks, Roman. Um, sure. Why don't we? We're 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 on a pretty tight schedule, but let's uh, let's open it up for a question or two. That was a big a big ask to to give us an overview on on the very wide ranging uh, array of services. So, thanks for doing that, Roman. Okay, nothing seems super urgent. So I think we will, uh, Claudia, why don't you start loading up your slides? So our, our next speaker is Claudia Hawkins, uh, who's an associate professor at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago and director of the viral hepatitis HIV co-infection program within their division of infectious diseases. She oversees clinical management of patients with HIV and viral hepatitis and conducts related research primarily in Tanzania and Nigeria. Um, so thanks so much, Claudia, for telling us about your project. 
Um, thanks very much, and thanks to Sarah for inviting me to speak at this meeting today. Um, so I'll be presenting some preliminary results uh, from our CIFAR EHE supplement, uh, the evaluation of an emergency implemented um, telemedicine intervention, its acceptability and impact on HIV care and treatment among persons living with HIV that we were awarded um, late last year. So just by way of background, so providing rapid and effective HIV care and support to persons living with HIV in order to reach sustained virologic suppression is one of the four key strategies for ending the HIV epidemic. And several factors have been shown to interfere with persons living with HIV engagement in care, including system level and personal barriers and racial, ethnic and sexual minorities are at particular risk. So telemedicine provides an innovative care delivery approach that might help um, overcome some of these barriers and improve health among persons living with HIV and have been shown to be effective in some HIV po populations, although data is mostly lacking. So the rapid implementation of uh, telemedicine into outpatient HIV clinics at Northwestern and our partners at Howard Brown as a result of COVID-19 provided us with this really unique opportunity to evaluate key outcomes um, uh, to evaluate, evaluate key implementation outcomes of telemedicine and, and the early impact of, on uh, technical and experiential quality of care in HIV clinics, as well as uptake amongst patients and providers. So um, our three aims of our uh, study were to, uh, using the re-aim uh, implementation uh, framework, measure, sorry, I have to move my screen over here. Uh, measure implementation outcomes and, and the early effectiveness of a newly implemented telemedicine program in HIV clinics and an academic and a community health set, uh, center setting. So Howard Brown are our partners in the community um, and using the uh, CIFA uh, identify uh, contextual factors associated with variability and adoption, reported appropriateness, uh, feasibility and acceptability of telemedicine among patients and providers and the measure of disparities in uptake and patient reported uh, acceptability, experiential quality, satisfaction and provider implementation outcomes with televisits uh, based on gender, race and age. So in the process of developing the grant, we uh, developed some uh, preliminary IRLM model to help guide the evaluation design and understand how televisits are or are not working and some of the contextual factors uh, associated with re-aim outcomes among patients and providers as well as strategies that weren't addressed or well implemented and whether televisits are resulting in the desired outcomes. So our study population included all persons with HIV, uh, living with HIV, who were active in care at our one Northwestern infectious disease clinic and 10 Howard Brown clinics uh, in Chicago. And this community academic partnership is a vital component of this research and will definitely extend the generalizability of the research to more diverse populations of persons living with HIV. And both sites implemented televisits emergently in March of 2020. At the start of COVID, um, albeit with slightly different strategies. So Howard Brown had a much um, more structured approach uh, between March and May of 2020, uh, with vir virtual visits really being uh, seen as a default and uh, training and orientation was provided for both patients and providers uh, in telehealth. Um, at the same time, at Northwestern, we had a little bit uh, less of a, a more informal approach to um, in introducing televisits. There was no hospital wide specific policy, um, at least at the in early on uh, in the COVID pandemic. Um, An RID clinic uh, provided one orientation and then a protocol to providers and, and patients weren't in trained in, uh, in using televisits or anything. They just were expected to jump onto Zoom or whatever uh, the, uh, the uh, um, video capability has been used. So we administered, we queried administrative data, electronic health records, uh, conducted patient and provider surveys, and are about to conduct some key informant interviews and patients and providers to evaluate our re-aim outcomes of reach, effectiveness, adoption, implementation, maintenance of televisits are uh, introduced during COVID pandemic. And this slide just shows the various tools uh, we used to assess the re-aim metrics. Uh, administrative data was used to assess the reach of televisits. Uh, clinical indicators were designed using electronic health information uh, among eligible patients to address, uh, assess the technical quality of care. And patient and provider surveys were conducted to evaluate implementation outcomes as well as reach and adoption amongst providers. And the key informant interviews, which we're planning this month, 
um, will be conducted among high and low adopting providers and patients uh, who've completed surveys to better understand some of the contextual barriers and facilitators to our re-aim results. So here's just some of our preliminary results. Um, obviously, we don't have everything right now, but just so I thought to share some of the preliminary results of our patient and provider surveys and some of the early indicator data on effectiveness. Uh, this slide just shows um, uh, the proportion of televisits um, over time during the COVID pandemic, uh, which we've uh, got by, uh, by um, querying administrative data uh, monthly. And as you can see, the proportion of televisits peaked at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. And again, although less so during the second and third COVID waves uh, in Chicago, at least, uh, with a much greater proportion of televisits conducted at Howard Brown, again, probably through the uh, more formal uh, program approach. Um, our patient survey was co-administered, uh, was uh, sorry, administered uh, between December of 2020 and, and, and uh, the end of February uh, of 2021. Uh, most participants were contacted by text or email if they had one listed or a phone or text uh, email listed. Those without emails were phoned um, uh, or approached in person in the clinic uh, through recruitment efforts of our research assistants. Um, and uh, with the, the attempts really to sort of get, get those with the least access, um, at least uh, to participate in the surveys. As you can see, even despite our best efforts, the completion rates were pretty low. Um, it's just a few demographics on our patient survey. So um, uh, they were well, fairly well distributed across the age groups um, and 80% 80, uh, 80 of respondents were cisgender male and 90% were either white or black um, Af African-American uh, race, uh, closely following the demographic of both of our uh, clinics. Um, and most uh, uh, who were offered uh, uh, televisits um, had accepted televisits with those declining televisits citing a preference for in person or needing labs is probably the most common reasons for why they declined. And then this um, slide just shows the uh, results of our implementation outcomes uh, measured. Uh, among patients on a Likert scale and uh, questions were adapted from the telehealth usability questionnaire and telemedicine satisfaction and usefulness questionnaire and the color coding is on the bottom left with the blue being more in the agree strongly agree categories. Um, it's a very busy slide but just a few things to highlight. Um, so about 80 to 90% of uh, patients felt the quality of interaction was pretty good and they were overall very satisfied. Uh, with televisits and felt they're acceptable, time-saving and convenient. Um, however, uh, te uh, televisits were not necessarily uh, viewed as an advantage in terms of better managing their health or improved access. And only 23% of uh, um, patients agreed that followed, they followed their doctor's advice better as a result of televisits and only 18% 18, 18 agreed that televisits were of better quality compared to in person. So I'll sort of take home from this was they were willing to do it, but not they didn't necessarily feel that the, those televisits were better than in person. Uh, technical difficulties were actually experienced in a very low proportion of respondents and among those who did report anything, it was mostly poor video quality um, or reception. And despite high satisfaction and willingness to engage in televisits, most patients actually preferred less than half or no visits to be televisits in the future. Although it's notable that two thirds of the uh, respondents at least wanted televisits as an option in the future. And we haven't done any sort of formal statistical testing around this yet, but when we were stratified some of these results by age um, and race, um, we found that older age groups preferred less than half or none and, and black uh, race also preferred less than half or none uh, to be televisits in the future. Most reported uh, having accessible sort of labs and home monitoring uh, it would make uh, these future visits more val valuable. So moving on to results of our provider survey. So these, this survey was administered to all providers at Northwestern and Howard Brown who are providing routine HIV care in the clinics um, uh, selected for this study at the same time as a patient survey. Uh, survey completion was um, fairly uh, decent. Uh, the, all of our participants were contacted by email and the survey was anonymous. Um, looking at adoption, more providers from Howard Brown were conducting more of their televisits by uh, visits by telehealth, which we um, knew as, a, as you know, assumed by the fact that it was introduced a little bit more formally, um, and they used they were more likely to use video. Uh, most didn't report any technical difficulties, and interestingly, only one reported like a patient not actually answering. So we sort of assume from that adherence to televisits generally very high. 
Um, reasons for not conducting visits um, or at all or sometimes are listed on the right hand of the slide. We did have two providers with not uh, com comfortable providing any visits um, and most of them were you know, need for labs or comfort level. And this is our implementation outcomes uh, among patient, uh, providers measured again on the Likert scale, uh, similar to our patient and adapted from the NOBAD and usability scale. And a couple of key things to point out, again, very busy slide. Uh, most providers found televisits acceptable and feasible with high proportions, either highly agreeing or agreeing with being able to communicate, provide good quality care and maintain privacy. And although two thirds of providers found them time saving and they met patients needs, uh, fewer agreed that televisits helped them be more effective or productive and uh, very few actually preferred televisits over in person visits. And while 70 to 90% of providers were supportive of televisits and open to working with colleagues and ways to maintain them, uh, fewer agreed that they had the required resources, at least right now, to, to conduct them. And similar to patients, more providers preferred less than half of all future visits to be televisits after COVID and, and similar suggestions were uh, given uh, to on how to make them more uh, valuable. And then finally, this slide just shows some of the preliminary results of our analysis of our clinical indicators assessing technical quality of care at Northwestern. I'm sorry, this is just the Northwestern site uh, data only. Um, and we did see a significant decline in some of our quality of care indicators uh, measured during three intervals during COVID up until March of this year, um, especially in HIV viral load measurement and control, BP measurement and control and STI screening. And our preliminary analysis, um, at least hot off the press, is uh, if we're using a general, generalized linear mixed model uh, methodology, televisits were only associated significantly with having any encounter, so the first indicator, and having a viral load measurement, and actually both were higher among those with a televisit. So it seems unlikely this decrease, this decline, at least preliminarily, is driven by uh, televisits and themselves. So overall, Televisits were found to be an acceptable and feasible and reliable and appropriate uh, mode of HIV care delivery during COVID-19 with high levels of agreement reported in these domains uh, by both patients and providers. Most patients and providers um, still wanted televisits as an option in the future, although interestingly, most preferred uh, conducting or attending less uh, uh, than um, uh, a half of all future visits virtually. Um, and then some barriers to televisits, uh, including lab visits and virtual uh, uh, and discomfort with virtual versus in person visits that were reported frequently among providers and patients who did not attend or conduct televisits, uh, I think definitely need to be explored further, which we'll be doing in our key informant interviews and, uh, and further studies needed to identify specific implementation strategies that might increase the effectiveness of televisits. So just a slide on some of our future planned analyses. So we will be doing some race, gender, and age comparisons across indicators and the survey responses, uh, obviously looking at how equitable televisits are, whether the responses differ between groups. And we will be doing, as I mentioned earlier, our key informant interviews, which I think are going to be critical now. We have results of our survey uh, to explore more in depth uh, some of the sort of re-aim outcomes that we assessed in our surveys and see what sort of more about the structural and personal barriers and facilitators to, to televisits. And particularly interested to see sort of what specific factors are driving this preference for in-person visits and what accounts for the relatively low preference for future televisits and which patients and conditions and visits are best suited for virtual visits. I think there's something we'll try to get at. Um, and the last point is really more on the comparison of effectiveness indicators, uh, which we'll be doing also by across the race, gender and age, but uh, uh, and visit type, which the latter of which I showed you some data on. So with that, I'd just uh, like to acknowledge our teams at Howard Brown and Northwestern and all the work of our staff and the patients and providers who uh, were participating in the surveys um, and take any questions. Thank you so much, Claudia. So I think we have at least one in the chat already. Karen, do you want to um, ask your question out loud or do you want me to read it? Um, yeah, I can do that. I'm conserving bandwidth here. My apologies. Um, so I just wanted to say it's great that you were able to capture these responses from both clients and providers because a lot of the um, other sorts of surveys that I've seen have been fairly one-sided. Um, 
I'm curious as to whether you'll ask participants about COVID and or tech fatigue or workforce burnout issues as you um, move forward with this um, key informant interview section of what you're doing, because these may affect preferences for future visits where we're sort of seeing that where we are in um, the Northeast. Um, yeah, that's actually, that's just a great suggestion. We had not um, really designed a question around that. I mean, we it may come up, um, but certainly we could include it as a prompt. Uh, and I think that's a, a very good point. So something we hadn't thought of. So. Thanks. Can't wait to see the rest of your results. I think Sheila made a, a comment in the chat. And Loretta has a question. How did either organization deal with language preferences? Yeah, so the first um, questions, the challenges and or uh, comment challenges and, cha and changing the way we interact with patients, I think is uh, very key. Um, and it may well be that the, we sort of get that out of um, our interviews that that's why there's sort of a bit of a lower preference for telehealth. Um, but I think, you know, is it some uh, certainly getting used to a new format and, and and i think it'll be interesting to see kind of over time as we also administer some second surveys to see sort of comfort level whether that's improved a lot you know a bit just having more experience um, you know doing televisits and, and and participating in those uh the language preferences so yeah we actually um didn't have a situation where we were uh at least had to deal with that but uh, we may face that with a key informant interview so yeah um uh we didn't uh, we had a uh, um translated forms but a consent form we didn't need to use great well in the interest of time thank you so much claudia and um i'm gonna introduce Stephen, if you want to start getting your slides loaded up. Um, so Stephen Sukumaran is Deputy Director of the HIV Center for Clinical and Behavioral Studies at the New York State Psychiatric Institute and Columbia University. He's an epidemiologist with an extensive background in public health program management and development, working with sexual minority and vulnerable populations. Um, he also supported uh, formative research on the inclusion of transgender populations in the national HIV behavioral surveillance instruments. So thanks, Stephen, for sharing with us on another current uh, EHE project. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for that introduction. And thank you to the network for having me today. Uh, today, I'll be presenting our two-year EHE supplement that was awarded late last year to the HIV Center for Clinical and Behavioral Studies. And it's entitled Evaluating Implementation Strategies for Behavioral Health Integration into HIV Prevention and Care, Including Telehealth. Our implementing partner on this project is the Northeast Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center, or ATC for short, and I'll be referencing them throughout this presentation. So we've known, uh, we've made tremendous biomedical advances in HIV prevention and treatment that have led to aspirational efforts to end the HIV epidemic in the United States. However, this goal will not be achieved without addressing the significant behavioral health, including mental health and alcohol and substance use problem of people living with HIV or at risk for acquiring HIV. Behavioral health problems are more prevalent among both of these groups compared to the general population and negatively influence each step in the HIV prevention and care continuum. So for this project, our team listed here on the left, joint forces with New Jersey BHIP, a four-year behavioral health and HIV primary care integration project funded by the New Jersey Department of Health to apply the IHI model of improvement and use a learning collaborative process across 19 sites to enhance behavioral health and HIV integration in Ryan White settings statewide in New Jersey. Among the participating sites in that project, four are located in Essex County, which is one of the federal EHE counties. Although this project focuses on four Essex sites and our jurisdictional partner there, the Newark EMA, we're also involving jurisdictional partners from six other EHE jurisdictions as seen on the right of the slide. So Hudson County in New Jersey, San Juan, Puerto Rico, and New York, Bronx, Queens, and Kings counties in New York. The partners from these six additional jurisdictions will act as an advisory board and possibly future implementation partners based on lessons learned from BHIP. New Jersey BHIP uh, is attempting to accomplish integration defined as improved screening, referral, and treatment of behavioral health conditions within HIV care settings to improve every stage of the combined HIV and behavioral health continuum. This statewide effort to create lasting system change is in its final year. Um, and BHIP did not originally utilize an implementation science framework, but through this supplement, we have the opportunity to do so retrospectively 
with four sites in one of the high need counties. The image you see here is a tool that was actually developed by DDIP. Uh, it's the combined HIV behavioral health care continuum. Many Ryan White sites were already familiar with the HIV care continuum. So framing care in this way was effective in demonstrating potential opportunities for improvement. We have aimed to leverage this familiarity as well as the systems already built to solve problems with this framework. And the hypothesis here is that individuals more retained in behavioral health treatment and experiencing improved outcomes of behavioral health will be more retained in their HIV care. I won't go into detail here, but the bubbles below the continuum highlight the ways in which the steps were measured by BICA. And as a recap, uh, the project I'm here discusses about taking a new view of what's been learned through BHIP. Uh, we're all very excited to better understand BHIP's potential as a way of transforming systems of HIV and behavioral health care, not only in New Jersey, but as an approach the federal EHV initiative can build upon. And the 19 site learning collaborative really holds so much promise as an approach. Again, the aim of BHIP is to develop a system of care in New Jersey that integrates behavioral health and HIV primary care services to improve system and patient outcomes. So the overall goals include Integration of behavioral health and HIV care, improve access to behavioral health care, improve patient outcomes, and system change in behavioral health capacity for the New Jersey HIV care system. At the HIV Center, we had already established a meaningful collaboration with the AATC, who was in turn already working on New Jersey BHIP. So we had the opportunity to combine our expertise and form a cohesive leadership team to facilitate this project. BHIP was also unique in that it was supported by leadership at the participating sites, as well as the Newark EMA. It already had that higher level buy-in that's crucial for macro level change and work, was working towards a shared goal that is to improve behavioral health integration. And given this context, we felt it would be very important to apply an implementation science or IS lens to BHIP as we could identify multi-level multi lessons learned to best facilitate the implementation of similar models in other jurisdictions. For our project, we applied um, an IS lens to BHIP to achieve four distinct aims. We'll attempt to satisfy these aims by utilizing existing BHIP data collected by the four Essex County sites, as well as by collecting some new data that I'll get into in a bit. So guided by our logic model that is informed by ERIC or the expert recommendations for implementing change and the CEPR, our aims are to identify the barriers and facilitators of New Jersey BHIP implementation of differences among sites, evaluate the impact of BHIP implementation strategies on A, implementation, service, and health outcomes, and B, the mechanisms through which implementation strategies work, to examine the use and impact of telehealth implemented in the context of COVID-19 on A, behavioral health service delivery and integration into HIV prevention and care, and B, patient behavioral health and HIV related outcomes. And lastly, to determine the applicability of BHIP strategies across jurisdictions to inform future intervention, adaptation, dissemination, and scale up. We're hoping to carry out three new activities with Essex County sites to get a clearer picture of the barriers and facilitators to BHIP implementation. So as you can see in this uh, table, on your screen, these detail these three new activities. The first column lists the type, the second lists the purpose and goals of each activity, and the third lists the number and types of participants we aim to re recruit. Of note at the bottom, our second round of qualitative interviews aims to explore how sites have initiated or expanded telehealth to enhance the overall screening, linkage, and or treatment. Again, this is a two-year project, so preliminary findings are pending. So why telehealth? Uh, as you may recall from our aims, one of our main focuses in applying an IS Lens New Jersey BHIP is to explore how our EHE sites initiated or expanded telehealth services to enhance behavioral health, screening, linkage, and or treatment. This stems from our recognition that many healthcare agencies across the globe were forced to rapidly shift to telehealth services after the onset of COVID-19. In a way, this shift established a new normal for behavioral health and HIV care and integration. Further, we learned from work on our first supplement from 2019 to 2020 that clients are reporting both positive and negative experiences with telehealth. There were things about telehealth that many wished to retain when receiving future services. And additionally, there were things that they did not prefer about virtual versus in-person visits. Specifically, we heard since the onset of COVID-19 that there has been an increase in severity of behavioral health conditions and an increase in requests for respective services. There's also insufficient behavioral health capacity to meet increased needs, largely due to limited staffing and burnout. So regarding things that patients reported that they liked about telehealth are that it bypasses transportation barriers, increases service access among under, underserved populations, it's well received by engaged and stable patients with adequate technology access and literacy, increases self-advocacy and service flexibility when patients can choose between in-person versus virtual care, and it makes HIV and behavioral health integration easier by facilitating virtual state staff case conferences and group huddles. Um, regarding disadvantages, many patients lack the necessary technology or technological skill set, 
they don't have a private space in which they can speak freely, and they often feel uh, it's missing a sense of trust, community, and connection afforded by in-person services. Many patients also experience more segmented care when different providers cannot jointly schedule telehealth visits, preventing warm handoffs and immediate transitions between providers. So though New Jersey BHIP was not originally des designed or implemented as a research project, we are retrospectively applying an IS lens to it to explore what worked well and what didn't work well in promoting behavioral health integration at a systemic level. Our end goal will be to compile a list of lessons learned that we can use to assemble recommendations for scaling up EHIP so similar models can be implemented in other EHE jurisdictions. Using language from this graphic, it's already a promising model or intervention enabled by the support or context of the Essex County EMA. So now we're trying to refine guidelines for effective implementation to promote positive outcomes. Part of the reason we chose to apply an IS lens to DHIP is that true behavioral health integration is required at all levels of the healthcare system, micro, meso, and macro. Often, to implement lasting changes to promote HIV and behavioral health care integration requires higher level structural changes, such as buying from key stakeholders and collaborations between researchers and community or government stakeholders. So as cited on this slide, this figure is from CHUA's 2017 Systematic Review of Interventions to Integrate HIV and Mental Health Services. Integration at the macro level is considered to involve integration of delivery systems within the HIV mental health and primary care sectors. Integration at the meso level is categorized on two dimensions, that is organizational integration and professional integration. Organizational integration involves collaborative networks and relationships between agencies providing HIV, mental health, and or substance use services. Whereas professional integration constitutes interprofessional partnerships of a multidisciplinary HIV, mental health, and or substance use team based on shared roles, responsibility, and accountability, reflecting the treatment plans of patients with multiple comorbidities. And lastly, at the micro level, Clinical uh, integration refers to the coordinated person-centered care in a single process across time, place, and discipline, wherein all components of the patient's care in HIV, mental health, and substance use are merged into one treatment plan. So as part of this commitment to implementation science, we are retrospectively developing a logic model based on what occurred in New Jersey BIHA. Ideally, once we've collected and analyzed all of the BIHA data, we can complete this model and use it to inform future projects in different settings that hope to better facilitate behavioral health integration at multiple levels. And with that, thank you. I'm happy to field any questions. And thank you also to my team. Let's see here on the left. Okay, right, thanks, Stephen. Don't see any questions already in the chat. So feel free to unmute yourself. Rich, you'll be up next if you wanna make sure your slides are ready. I think we're gonna have a conversation first before we put the slides up, so. Uh, oh, great. Okay. But they're ready. Yeah, no problem. Um, Okay, so I like the people using the chat. Feel free to keep using the chat to ask Stephen questions um, as we march along. So, um, so Chris and Rich are going to be next. Um, they're both from APNH, a place to nourish your health, which is the first and oldest aid service organization in the state of Connecticut. Um, APNH also serves people at risk of or impacted by HIV, substance use, mental illness, and related conditions. Um, Chris Cole is the executive director. He also serves on Sierra's community advisory board and several of the HIV planning bodies in Connecticut. And Rich Radakia is the director of clinical services, who is an LCSW with a master's of science in social work from Columbia and over 30 years of experience um, with social work practice. So thank you for being here to tell us a little bit about your recent experiences. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. And I'm going to just give a little bit of an overview of the telehealth uh, activities that we've taken on over the last year and a half. And Rich is going to talk a little bit more of the real data that he's seen in our behavioral health program. Um, it was great to listen to everyone prior to us because we're doing many of the things that we've heard. We've uh, engaged in home testing where we were sending out test kits and about halfway through uh, our first several months of um, doing that and not seeing people in person for testing, we began doing uh, telehealth visits where we would send out a home test kit and someone could uh, connect with one of our prevention specialists and do the test at home 
uh, with some guidance from the prevention specialist and then send that in. Uh, we have partnered with uh, Hey Mister, we heard about earlier, to provide prep in the community and do that uh, virtually utilizing um, technology and breaking down some of the barriers of access to care. Um, we are providing medical case management services utilizing uh, telehealth uh, exclusively during the pandemic. And now we are doing a hybrid model where we will uh, see folks in the office or by telehealth. And many of our folks have chosen to continue to work with their case managers um, virtually rather than in person. Uh, it certainly makes it a whole lot easier for people to access the services and care that we provide without needing to um, have transportation and some of the other barriers that often get in the way. Uh, and one of the things Rich will be pointing out in our behavioral health and we're seeing as well with our medical case management is a higher show rate and more engagement by some of our um, clients. And then uh, we've been doing our psychosocial support services uh, through uh, virtual programming as well. And um, as part of that, we did a technology survey of uh, folks who are engaged in our Aging Positively program, which is uh, for folks who are over 50 living with HIV. And some of the interesting things that we found uh, in surveying 53 of our clients engaged in this program, um, nine individuals had no internet access at all, or 17%. 42% uh, uh, had Wi-Fi in their home. 83% uh, had smartphones, but of those 83%, 59% had limited data on their smartphones. So we're unable to uh, access some things like uh, telehealth appointments or things that used high levels of data for any length of time. Um, individuals with other devices like computers, laptops, or tablets was uh, 43%. And individuals interested in help with or learning more about technology uh, was 83%. So we invested in, um, purchasing 50 tablets and unlimited data that we distributed to 50 people who were engaged in our Aging Positively program, hired two peer navigators that would help them get connected to programs and services in the community and a technology coordinator that would help them with the technology end of things so that we could get people connected and um, help break down some of those technology barriers. So that's been our experience with uh, telehealth. We were not doing any telehealth. Uh, prior to um, the pandemic are very limited. Uh, and uh, now we're doing more telehealth than in-person uh, visits as we get back to um, reopening and seeing people here in the building. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to Rich who will talk about his experience with um, both our uh, peer program and our behavioral health program. Thanks, Chris. Um, you know, we're blessed to have a, a leadership team at APNH that a few of us are either early adopters or um, are constantly on the lookout for natural disasters. Um, you know, my dad used to always say, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean that somebody isn't out to get you. Um, so if we started meeting as a leadership team at, before the end of February, talking about this thing that was emerging and, um, I had explored some different uh, telemedicine uh, portals and, you know, looking at the statistics of our clients, um, probably about 30 or 40%, 30 to 40% of our uh, behavioral health clients were um, active in the MyChart system at, in Epic. So we knew that trying to work through the Epic system to do telemedicine was going to be a problem. So I found, um, we ended up using doxy.me, which is a very simple program where I can text a client the link, they can tap on it on their phone or tablet and it pops up into the, the room. So we found ways in which we could make access and use, use using um, technology easier um, was um, very important in terms of helping our clients access to care. Um, and as was said, we found by um, end of April that uh, we needed additional help, um, clients with limited access, limited data. So we explored the, the, um, uh, the Connect program to, to, to purchase the, the um, tablets and help, 
have actual peers, actual people, and, and, and it helped to have people that were over 50 um, and, and that had HIV as well to uh, work as peers to help uh, bridge the gap and, and help our folks connect to, to um, the tablets that we were providing. And I have to say, um, we're a year into that, that over a year into that part of the program and, and it's been extremely successful. So I'm gonna share my screen and just share a little bit of, from the behavioral health side, here it is, um, from the behavioral health side, um, some of the statistics um, from our, you know, looking at the numbers of clients that we serve. These are new clients per year. And you can see, I don't know if you can see my arrow when I'm moving it, but um, in, in 2019, 2020, we were um, increasing in 2021 and in, in 20, the year 2021 is uh, the grant year that ended February 29th, 2021. So it's March 1st to February 29th. There was actually a decrease in new clients coming in. So one of the things that we identified and are working um, on in, in this particular part of the, you know, going into the second quarter of this grant year is figuring out how to um, connect with folks that have not been in our services before. The transfer of folks that were in services before to telemedicine was very easy, but attracting new clients, getting referrals for, for new clients has been a little bit uh, lagging behind. So we're working on that. In terms of services, however, you can see, even though we saw fewer folks, uh, the number of clinical services for substance abuse here in the mustard color and, and the red color uh, for, for mental health services just skyrocketed last year. Um, and, and in this last slide here, the actual numbers of um, <clears throat> services per client uh, for mental health went from 14.39 services per client in 2020, uh, 20, the year that grant year that ended uh, February 29th at the very beginning of pandemic. Um, you know, and and for last year went up to 24.84. So over 10, you know, almost double, uh, over 10 uh, sessions per client increase for the mental health and from 10.56 services per client to 19.31 services per client last year. So, you know, totally um, a, a, a stark increase in terms of the actual numbers of services that people um, uh, attended. And, and what I'd just like to point out about that is the numbers of no-shows uh, with telemedicine went way down. Uh, although at the beginning we had many clients who tried to have their telemedicine services on the bus or at the green, um, <laughs> we, we quickly educated about uh, the need for a private place for uh, for the services to be held, uh, but the actual number of no-shows uh, to, to our sessions went way down, and obviously the number of sessions kept went way up. So um, as we are moving forward into this hybrid model, um, you know, I, I now offer my clients the option of in-person in versus uh, telemedicine. And I'd say at a 70 to 30 ratio of people that want uh, inpatient is 30% of my clients that want to move from telemedicine back to inpatient in-person in uh, visits. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, and there's, there's other factors. And I, I believe that what all end up working, you know, there were some clients that only wanted to, to, to see me in person. Um, and, you know, um, some people that, you know, uh, feel you know, because of transportation issues, because of uh, mobility issues, they feel like uh, telemedicine is just increased access and ease of services. Um, I had my infectious disease doc appointment yesterday and it was in the middle of my day with a client before and a client after. Um, you know, so 
I, I know that for me, that access has been very helpful, not having to take a half day off of work in order to, to have my infectious disease doc visit. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, and anecdotally, I'd add in terms of my schedule, I know I'm on time <laughs> a lot more. Clients are not waiting for me in the waiting area. Um, and, and in fact, uh, you know, clients are, are really uh, regimented in terms of their ability to show up for client, uh, for appointments. So that's all I have. I'm open to any questions that you may have. Thanks, Fred. Karen asks if you've noticed any differences between established versus new patients in terms of the modality, I guess, that they prefer. Um, you know, it's, it, I, I do have a handful of new clients that I started seeing through pandemic, uh, all have continued to want virtual. Um, it's the folks that had seen me in person before that want to go back to in-person uh, visits. So, and again, that's, this is not from a research, you know, just an experiential anecdotal um, visit. We are actually working with some, some um, grad students to do some research. Chris, did you want to talk about that? Um, sure. And, and uh, we're, we're working with some folks at Yale to look at our um, telehealth, the attitudes of our uh, clients and whether we, whether and at what level we continue telehealth. Um, I know that uh, I saw Dion, Dion on here. Um, that was one of the names. I'm not sure if others are on, uh, but uh, we're excited to have partnered uh, through the um, FLAGS program uh, to look at uh, whether our clients want us to continue more telehealth uh, or whether they'd prefer more in-person. Great, thanks guys. So um, in the interest of time, let's, um, let's move on to Paul and Catherine uh, to tell us a little bit about their experiences um, in the New London area. Um, so Paul Choudhury is assistant professor in the Yale program in addiction medicine, general internist and addiction medicine specialist, as well as health services researcher. His clinical work includes serving as the attending physician for New London CARES, which is a low threshold buprenorphine program. Um, also, Catherine Hinojosa is a nurse practitioner at Community Health Center in New London. And I will turn it over to you two. So hello, thank you for having us. Um, so um, as many of you have said, uh, you know, at Community Health, uh, we were forced to um, rapidly shift you know, to telehealth services at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it, uh, our use of telehealth services has changed very significantly since the beginning of the pandemic. We started with the doximity application at the beginning and uh, due to privacy concerns, we um, it almost immediately changed to the Zoom um, platform. Um, again, on the months of March and April and March, I would say, uh, we saw a decrease of patient visits uh, because everything was shifted, uh, shifting towards just doing the services, uh, um, you know, from telehealth. Um, but then as we started to grow, we started to reach out more patients, uh, especially the most vulnerable patients who didn't, who couldn't leave their home because of their pre-existing conditions. Um, personally, you know, I was able to connect with people um, um, who I treat for HIV and also for substance use disorders who uh, were lost to care. And, you know, like our secretaries were constantly calling um, patients who were, um, you know, red flagged on our system to um, that they didn't have a follow-up appointment in like the last year. So um, I was able to connect with them. Uh, the only concern that I had was that, you know, like the minimal access that we had uh, to um, phlebotomy services. Uh, so I couldn't have a uh, uh, a real grasp into their, you know, medical evaluation in terms of, you know, HIV uh, viral load, uh, CD4 count, because, you know, there weren't any phlebotomists available at that moment. Um, so it, it was, a, you know, like, again, uh, shifting all the time, you know, our, 
IT, uh, you know, services and upper management at our clinics did most of the work. You know, we had biweekly sessions uh, with providers to ensure that all of us were trained and felt confident uh, navigating the virtual, uh, you know, visit forums. Uh, again, as I said, we started slow, uh, just offering telehealth via telephone visits, and then we expanded to video visits. Um, you know, it was for us, it was very important to be, um, you know, like aware of the latest uh, health policies, uh, and most importantly, regarding the delivery of uh, medication assisted treatment. Uh, and um, it was a team effort to coordinate the initial face to face requirement to initiate opioid use disorder treatment um, at our, our opioid. Um, you know, treatment program. Um, even though our clinic um, switched to full-time telehealth, we still had nurses and one provider who came to in person to the office to see patients. Unfortunately, this provider wasn't ex waiver, so some of our uh, substance use um, patients um, who wanted to do an initial face-to-face -to, -face to initiate. Um, buprenorphine treatment had to link with a nurse and uh, link with me via video to have that face-to-face -face requirement. Um, um, you know, like um, the benefits that we see uh, to, um, you know, like with telehealth is that, you know, like we can meet our patients uh, where they are, you know, again, it was mentioned that transportation is a big issue, you know, like um, we ensure that, you know, like if people want to connect with us, um, um, we have a mobile clinic van as well going to them and then having that initial appointment sometimes is a face to face requirement for initiation of substance use disorder treatment. Um, um, one of our biggest challenges um, was access or is access to technology, uh, you know, like, and this can mean many this can mean many things like, you know, access uh, of our patients to a working smartphone, access to Wi-Fi services, also uh, technology uh, literacy. You know, we have seen that many patients, although they have a smartphone, they have access to Wi-Fi, they just cannot, uh, you know, like navigate how to use Zoom. Um, we have a team of, um, you know, um, coordinators, um, our IT coordinators who meet one-to-one um, -one with our patients to uh, teach them how to download a Zoom application, teach them how to, you know, like click on the link, how to, you know, unmute themselves, how to, you, uh, you know, turn on their cameras because, you know, like on some of our appointments, I, I need to evaluate, you know, a skin condition, something that, you know, like I need to see via video. So um, thankfully we have the help of our, our, our coordinators to do that. Um, you know, like I foresee that telehealth is going to definitely going to continue to reach our most vulnerable patients. And um, and also I foresee that we have to work really hard uh, to kind of like adapt to this new technology in terms of, you know, how to, um, you know, like have more more resources and more services offered through um, telehealth, telephone, televideo appointments. Um, some of the, you know, like the questions that I would like, you know, like to have answered moving going forward and, you know, opportunities of research, um, I would say it's like, you know, um, how to inform patients and educate them on when it's appropriate to request a televisit appointment. I have a lot of, uh, you know, like people who struggle with, you know, like musculoskeletal issues and, you know, like lower back pain, any of these type of, uh, you know, like conditions. So it's really, really hard to conduct a visit like this via video. So, you know, there has to be some education into to our patients to say, okay, this is an appropriate visit to, you know, like to request as a video appointment or not. Also more education into uh, to our um, secretaries who are making the appointment um, on the phone, kind of like saying, okay, is this appropriate to see this patient who hasn't been been seen in a year or two, doesn't have any blood work done, hasn't done any other blood work. So we are working towards uh, kind of um, um, through questionnaires and through uh, interviews with our secretaries and with our patients to improve this. And um, I think also another part, uh, educating patients, um, you know, like in terms of privacy and how to, um, you know, how to conduct themselves during the telehealth visits. We had some occasions where patients are connecting from the bathroom or they are in their car, you know, like buying, you know, like going through the drive through uh, ordering food. So like all of that, uh, I, I think, you know, we need to reach out um, more. So to kind of like understand like how to conduct yourself during a televisit. So those are, um, that's my input. Um, and I think I'm gonna pass it to Paul who also works with us. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Catherine. Uh, and I, I apologize uh, to everyone if there's a little bit of background noise. I'm actually in the field today working. Um, and uh, so I, I'm, a, I'm an attending physician for the uh, New London Cares program, which partners very closely with Catherine. Um, and the, the New London Cares program uh, started, it, it's um, based in, with two partnering organizations, Ledgelight Health District, which is uh, the public health department, and then um, uh, Alliance for Living, which is a Ryan White program that has also expanded uh, into harm reduction services for people who use drugs. Um, and in, in response to uh, rising overdose deaths in the region, uh, the CARES program started initially uh, basically a community outreach, or we call them patient navigator program. Um, and it's uh, people who have with lived experience who uh, reach out to the community and places where uh, people uh, who use drugs um, uh, get together and uh, build relationships, offer harm reduction services. Uh, but very early on in the launch of the program, uh, it was very clear that it was difficult to connect people who were interested in uh, medic medication treatments such as Suboxone to that care in a timely fashion. And so uh, they, they brought in uh, me, we had partnered, I partnered with them. And um, basically once a week, I circulate in the community with uh, the patient navigators. And when we meet someone who's interested in medication treatment, uh, we started right there. Um, and we started the program about two, uh, basically two years um, prior to COVID-19. And we were, you know, as a new program, we were kind of ramping up, increasing numbers. Um, and, you know, the, the volume of people we were seeing was, was steadily growing. And then, of course, COVID-19 disrupted everything. And, and I should say, too, you know, just to kind of state the obvious, we were not using telehealth um, you know, for the, for the community-based uh, buprenorphine initiations I was doing, we were not using uh, telehealth at all. Um, the, the immediate impact of COVID-19 was, we, so the whole backbone of our program was the patient navigators developing relationships with people in the community and then building, leveraging that trusting relationship uh, then to connect them to me, the physician. And that, that workflow was completely disrupted by COVID-19 because there was part of our program was that sort of per, informal, in-person contact to leverage uh, a sense of trust. Um, it, so it took us a little while to adjust. You know, I, I, we switched over to Zoom to try to do uh, buprenorphine inductions. Um, there was a period where our patient navigators stopped circulating in the community. And during that time, we had very few inductions. We just, we, we weren't reaching people. And we, and it was, we knew it was a very frustrating time because we also knew that the risk for overdose was certainly not abating. Um, but the, but we did sort, it took some time, but we did, you know, eventually the, the thing that happened too was our patient navigators started circulating again. And one of the, I mean, one of the ways we've ended up doing a lot of these uh, mobile low threshold buprenorphine inductions is I will be available on Zoom, but the patient, the patient navigator is often with the person. So they're in the community, they're, they've met them at the housing shelter. Um, and so, and then the, the kind of the nice things about that is A, I know that there's someone who's, you know, sort of laid eyes on the person also is, you know, checked on them in sort of a physical sense. But also the, the Navigate often will use our own equipment. You know, we have a tablet, we have a phone. Um, and so that can sometimes troubleshoot some of the technological barriers. Um, and then the other, we, we, at, at the same time, we've also done uh, the version where everyone's on Zoom and it's a three-way call. Um, you know, our, our program really emphasizes just connecting people to care however we can. Um, and so like many people, we've, we've kind of in, in, the, in the setting of COVID been making this up as we go. Um, but I, I do, I will say sort of qualitatively, I do feel the process of starting someone on buprenorphine, I certainly prefer to do it in person. <laughs> and I don't, you know, I don't have any data or any, you know, just, it's just sort of my experience of doing it. Um, the ability, I mean, the ability to lay eyes on someone, kind of see their presence, you know, how are they dope sick? What's their, what's kind of their current status? It is reassuring. It also, with the, the amount of stigma that comes with these medications and the perception, you know, sometimes I feel being physically present to sort of affirm them sort of as a, as a physician to sort of give them, you know, a positive sort of, you know, affirm their need, show them respect. Um, I do feel like that helps in terms of building trust and keeping people engaged in care. And, um, and I just wonder how much of that, 
will translate into um, telehealth and starting someone on buprenorphine with telehealth. With that said, with the ones, you know, uh, you know I was talking with our navigator today, with, with the, you know, inductions we've done, we seem to be having success. People, I mean, we're, the, pro, the overall process seems to still be working. So, um, you know, that's, that's a kind of a quick rundown of, of, of some of the things we've seen. Great. Thanks. Thank you both. Okay, um, so we've heard we've heard a number of different um, about a number of different programs. Um, some of the benefits that people have experienced with telehealth, and I think we've identified some specific um, challenges as well. So, um, Pete, if you want to launch the breakout rooms, if you are uh, if you're going to stay with us for the next half an hour, then um, stay with us, and we'll be launching the breakout rooms. You'll have a facilitator in each breakout room. I've also